So here are 12 things I never knew about Python until recently. First, we have the pprint function. So this function essentially allows us to print stuff in a more human-readable formatted manner. Let's say we have a multi-nested dictionary. And if we print this using the normal print function, we will get this. So we will get this output and notice that this isn't very human readable. However, we can use the pprint function. So from pprint, import pprint. So note that we do not need to pip install this. And we pprint d. And if we run it again, notice that our output is in a much more human readable format. So another cool thing that we can do with pprint is that we can edit the amount of indent. So let's say we set indent to 4. And if we run this again, we will get this. So notice that our indent is now 4 spaces. Number 2, the backspace character. So the backspace character or backslash b will actually delete characters. So let me demonstrate by doing this. So print a, b, c, d, e, f, g and backspace, backspace backspace and after the three backspaces i'm going to put one two three and if we run this we will get a b c d one two three so notice that e f g is not there anymore because it has been backspaced by the three backspace characters number three injecting css into jupyter so notice here that i'm in jupyter lab instead of vs code so first off i'm going to create a test pandas data frame and if we run this we have this data frame so next, I'm going to inject some CSS into our pandas data frame. So to do that, we first need to import this from ipython.display import html. And next, let's write a function that will inject some CSS into our data frame. So define style. So this style function will take in our data frame. So first, let's create a HTML string. So HTML is equals to triple quotes style tag. So this is the style tag that we use to put our CSS in. And let's create a data frame CSS class. And let's say we want to set the background color as red. And here we need to add our df to HTML. So this to HTML method essentially converts our data frame into HTML, which is what we see here. So in a way, we are simply adding this style on top of our HTML. And lastly, in our function, we need to display HTML, HTML. And let's call our function and let's see what happens. And here we can see that the background color has become red. And this is the effect of the CSS code over here. So now instead of turning our data frame red, let's turn it upside down. So to do this, we simply need the transform CSS method and rotate 180 degrees. And let's run this. And here we have an upside down data frame. So as long as you know what you're doing with CSS, you can do whatever you want with your data frame in Jupyter. Number four, we can actually ask our user for the user password. So similarly, we do not need to pip install anything. We simply need to do an import. So from get pass, import get pass. So get pass is a built-in module that enables the user to enter their password while still having their password hidden. So print enter password and password is equals to get pass and print you have entered password so let's run this and see what happens so let's say i'm going to enter a b c d e f g so notice that when i'm typing the password does not appear on my screen however when i hit enter you have entered a b c d e f g so if i did not print this whatever i type as a user would be hidden from view so with this get pass, you can enable your user to enter their passwords more securely. Number five, we can actually make some code run after our return statement. So in a normal function, let's say return one and return two, usually in a function, after the return statement, nothing else happens in a function. So because of this, return two will never be reached. However, we can actually make stuff run after the return statement if we use the try except finally block. So let's get rid of this. Try print one, print two, and return three. Except print four, and finally print hello. So what's happening here is that three will be written by our function, 
but after 3 is written, this hello will always be printed because it is in the finally block. So let's test this out. x is equals to hello. And if we print x, we will print 3, but we will also print hello that is from the finally block. So let's run this. So notice that we have 1, 2, hello, and then 3. So once again, using the try except finally block, we can actually make stuff run after the return statement in a function. Number six, we can actually unprint stuff in Python. So I'm going to start off with these two escape characters, cursor up and clear. So the cursor up character will make your cursor in the terminal go up by one level, and the clear character will clear the entire line that the cursor is on. Next, let's add them together to make clear line. So clear line is equal to cursor up plus clear. So let's put this to the test. So if we print apple, orange, pear, and let's make our script sleep for a while. From time import sleep, sleep for one second. And let's print clear line times two. So this will clear two lines. And very importantly, we need to ensure that the end is nothing. And afterwards, let's print pineapple. So what's happening here is, we will first print apple, orange, and pear. And after one second, orange and pear will disappear. And afterwards, pineapple will be printed. So let's run this and check. So notice that after a short delay, orange and pear did disappear, and pineapple was printed in its place. Number seven, creating classes using the type function. So normally, we use the type function to check the type of a variable. For example, x is equals to 1, 2, 3, and we print the type of x. And if we print this, we get integer. However, did you also know that the type function can be used to create a class? So let's say we want to create a normal class. So class dog. So define init self name h. Self name is equals to name and self h is equals to h. And let's give our dog class a method bug. So self print oof. So this is how we would normally create a class. However, we can also create this same class using the type function. So I'm going to comment this out first. So to do that, we first create the class name is equals to type. And inside type, we need to pass in three things, which are the class name, a tuple, basis, and dictionary. So the class name is simply a string representing the name of the class. Basis is a tuple that contains other classes that this certain class inherits from. And the dictionary here is a dictionary that contains the methods that the class has. So let's start with the class name. So dog. And basis, let's just pass in an empty tuple. And for dictionary, we have to pass in a bunch of stuff. So we want to pass in init. So we have a string called init. And we have to point to a init function. And next, we have the bug method. So we do the same. So bug. And we point it to a bug function. So because init and bug are not defined right now, we have to define them. So define init. So similarly, we take in self name and h, and self name is equal to name, and self h is equal to h. And we do the same for buck, so self, and we print woof. So after we have defined our methods, we can pass them into our dictionary, which will then allow us to create our dot class. So now, let's test out our dot class. Rocky is equal to dot, and it takes in a name and an h, so Rocky and fork. And let's say rocky dot buck. And let's run this and we will get woof. So here we can actually use the type function to dynamically create classes. Number eight, integer and float. So I probably should have known this much earlier, but it is what it is. So the cool thing about integer is that if we initialize integer without anything, we get zero. And this is the same for float. So let's print integer open and close bracket and float open and close bracket. So this will be 0, and this will be 0, 0.0. And let's run this. And here we have it, 0 and 0, 0.0. Number 9, we can actually use Python to open certain websites on our web browser. And to do this, we simply need to import web browser. So note that we do not need to install this using pip. And next, web browser dot open new. And let's say https google.com. 
and if we run this our web browser will open and here we have it google.com open in our web browser because of our python script so this can be pretty useful if you want to open certain websites for your users number 10 we can actually set variables dynamically using the globals variable so to start off let's define a bunch of variables a is equals to 4 and b is equals to 5 and if we print a and b we will simply get 4 and 5 however using globals we can set this dynamically so we just need to do this globals open and close bracket a is equals to 4 and let's do the same for b once again if we run this we will get the same result 4 and 5 so this could be useful if you wish to set many variables for example let's say i want to set variables from a to z so i can actually do this using a for loop rather than having to type out a is equals to 1 b is equals to 2 and so on so for i in alphabets and let's set the n is equals to 1 globals i is equals to n and after this we simply add 1 to n so we can do this print a b c d e f g and let's see if it's 1 to 7 and here we have it even though we did not write the statements a is equals to 1 b is equals to 2 c equals to 3 and so on all of this has been set dynamically because of our globals however do note that this can be considered to be terrible practice and do not use this in your production code number 11 the dot py extension does not matter that much so here i'm just going to print hello world and with two exclamation marks and to run this script we type python a.py because this file is named a.py and if we run this we will get hello world with two exclamation marks however if i were to change dot py to something else this will still actually work so i'm going to change this to a.apple and next i'm going to run a.apple and we will still get hello world so it is actually not compulsory for the extension to be a .py. Number 12, mapping proxies and dictionary here is actually different for classes and objects. So let's start off by creating a simple class, doc. So same thing, define init. So a doc will take in name and age and self name is equals to name and self age is equals to age. So next, let's talk about the dictionary variable. So I'm going to create a doc so dog rocky and he's four years old and i'm going to print dog dot dictionary and i'm going to run this and we will get name is rocky and age is four so this dictionary variable actually stores all methods and attributes of our objects so if we print the type of our dictionary dot dot underscore dic we will get a dictionary however if we choose to print the class dog dot dictionary and the type of it we will get something pretty different so here in our first line we have name is rocky and age is four and this is just a simple dictionary however in our second line we actually get a mapping proxy so a mapping proxy is essentially an immutable dictionary which means a dictionary that cannot be changed at all and if we attempt to check the dictionary of our class we will get a mapping proxy so this is designed this way because python does not want you to dynamically change the methods of a class so thanks for watching and i hope you have learned at least one new thing about python today